Okay, so today uh, we're going to be discussing cryo for quantum. Okay, so just a quick uh, summary on the format and logistics. So, you know, everyone will be muted except the speakers. Uh, your questions using chat, there's a chat box window. You can also just put a question in the commentary in the chat. Also, the recording of the webinar will be posted in the future on YouTube. Okay, in terms of the agenda, I'm going to give a brief update on the quantum marketplace uh, and then some overview and trends in cryo and then uh, cryo for quantum lineup, which we have six companies presenting today. And then we're going to get into a potentially very interesting roundtable discussion and also a snapshot of the next webinar coming up on a schedule. Okay, so the quantum marketplace really, it's two things. One is it's its a web directory on the QDC website. It's publicly facing all the companies that present or not present. You can see them in here, and then there's a description of each one, uh, as well as our YouTube channel. Uh, you can just go to youtube.com slash quantum marketplace, and you can see the webinar recordings of, of all of these. So... We've been getting a tremendous amount of feedback with these webinars, and you know many of the presenters have have identified that it's been raising their awareness. It also has facilitated collaboration and deals and partnerships, even between competing companies sometimes. Okay, so some overview and trends. So you know many types of quantum computing use cryo, uh, you know, but superconducting is 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 heavily relying on cryo and qubits continue to you know, grow in density and processing power, which you know, puts greater demands on the cryo that's used in that, in that format. As well as you know, single photon detectors uh, maybe doesn't get as much press, but you know, they're needed today in areas of quantum sensing and quantum networking, not an exhaustive list, but uh, there, there will be some of that discussion today as well. Um, so all of this is actually driving a need for advanced cryo for quantum, as Celia had just pointed out. I thought it would be great to review, uh, maybe not everyone is familiar with this, uh, many people in quantum for sure have this etched in their, in their minds, but I wanted to give everybody a, a sort of snapshot of what we're talking about here. So boiling water is, is uh, you know, 212 Fahrenheit or 100 C. Okay, so a nice day at the beach is 300 Kelvin, 80 degrees Fahrenheit, 27 C. Okay, freezing water is 273 Kelvin, 32 Fahrenheit, zero degrees C. Okay, cryo for quantum typically runs in the 10 Kelvin to millikelvin range for most of it. And if we compare, well, that's one Kelvin is, is minus 458 Fahrenheit or minus 272 degrees C. That is really, really, really cold. Uh, and all six of these companies make products in this area. Okay, cryo for quantum. So we're gonna have uh, Jack DeGrave from Form Factor. He's the Director of Business Development. Uh, we're gonna have Vikas Anat, uh, who's the CEO at Photon Spot. We're gonna have Arifin Leonardo at Business Development Manager at Cryomech. We're gonna have Stuart Woods, who's Managing Director of Oxford Instruments. We're gonna have David Gunnarsson, at, who's the CTO of Blue Force, and Corbett Tillman Dick, who's the CEO of Maybell. All right. Yeah. Thanks for the the introduction here, Mark. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about uh, Form Factor's position uh, with cryogenics uh, in the quantum marketplace. Uh, so real quick, uh, Form Factor has been publicly traded since about 1993. Uh, they've been a mainstay in the semiconductor industry. Um, over the last 12 months, we've done about 800 million in revenue, and we have about 2,300 employees worldwide. Um, so today, though, I'm going to be focusing on the cryogenic uh, test and measurement portfolio and then some of the recent developments um, in terms of what we're doing for deployment uh, for the quantum marketplace. So our temperature solutions really span from uh, 300 Kelvin all the way down to about 10 millikelvin. Um, in addition to those test and measurement systems, we also have a suite of probe, or, uh, probe cards, um, engineering probes that can be used anywhere from you know, small scale lab R&D all the way up through niche production and, and complete you know, volume, full-scale wafer stuff. Um, the, the quantum and cryogenic part of the company right now is, has a couple key areas of focus, um, which includes things like superconducting and spin-based uh, qubit devices, CMOS, uh, CMOS-based devices, as well as uh, components that are required to support the entire quantum computing chain. And we also do some work in the photonic device world. So uh, again, looking at the full product suite that I'll be talking about, 
Um, I've previously presented on the ADR cryostats and the chip scale probers, including uh, the, the fully automatic wafer scale prober. Um, and then we have a full suite of products that include things like probes, probe sockets uh, that can be used with all of the cryogenic, um, the product line. Uh, but the, the newest development from Form Factor is the dilution refrigerator technology. Um, so now we are the largest US-based supplier of dry dilution refrigerators. Um, this comes through a recent acquisition that happened a couple months ago. And that dry dilution refrigerator product line um, has base temperature below 10 millikelvin. We have solutions up to about 500 microwatts at 100 millikelvin. So I'll show a little bit more about that. Um, with uh, form factor backing the dilution refrigerators, um, we're now also able to offer, I think for the first time to the market, financing options. So um, a lot of times these fridges come with, you know, very high capital cost uh, and form factor is able to provide flexible pricing solutions for everyone uh, that ranges from academic labs to startup quantum computing companies to the leading uh, qubit developers or quantum processor developers. Uh, we also have an extensive service and support network. So I mentioned that Form Factor is a worldwide company. Uh, so we're bringing up the entire network um, in terms of being able to support the, the dilution refrigerators and ensure maximal uptime. Um, and then the largest fridge that we're offering right now is a 600 microwatt at 100 millikelvin fridge. Uh, we have solutions for complete RF signal chains. Um, and then the, the manufacturing center for these dilution refrigerators is headquartered in Woburn, Massachusetts. So um, everything is produced in the US here. So that's the, the newest product. Uh, shifting gears a little bit, I'll talk about our cryogenic test and measurement service. Uh, so this is uh, housed in our advanced cryogenic lab in Boulder, Colorado. Um, and really the, the impetus for starting this was that we saw a problem in the cryogenic world. Uh, essentially cryogenic systems come with a very high capital cost and very long lead times. Many customers need faster access to data. They don't want to suffer through that long lead time, um, or they need to you know, try a, a new measurement and see whether or not the value is there for them to explore that in a deeper way and really invest in that. So that's really the, um, the start of the, the cryogenic test and measurement as a service. So this provides customers with immediate cryogenic access. Um, so they can either use the, the large scale fully automated wafer prober, um, which is up and running in our Boulder, Colorado facility, or they can work with one of our millikelvin testers, whether it uh, is an ADR system or a dry dilution refrigerator. Here's a little bit more information about the uh, fully automatic wafer prober. Uh, so we've seen several use cases come from the leading developers out there. Um, right now, the system is being used um, for statistical process control, especially for looking at the scaling of devices, whether it's a spin qubit or a superconducting qubit device. Um, a lot of preliminary measurements are made uh, on this type of system, including um, your basic S parameter measurements on uh, 4K niobium resonators. We've looked at JJ resistance, and then um, just due to the large amount of data that can come out of a system like this, um, a lot of companies are starting to develop machine learning models that um, will allow them to draw correlations between what they can get at higher temperatures and the data that they would see at lower temperatures. <clears throat> Here's an example of some of the measurements that have been performed. The data shown here was a collaboration with uh, MIT Lincoln Labs. Uh, so we looked at a, a variety of measurements on wafer, um, including uh, things like squiff B field on the wafer, uh, inductance versus unit length, the JJ critical current, normal resistance, and gap current. Um, in this particular measurement, uh, we looked at 24 based or 24 squid based test circuits. Um, if you would have done this on a typical chip prober that you would see in, in the cryogenic world at you know, an academic lab or an R&D facility, um, something like this would take well over a week um, to fully measure all those devices. With the wave prober, we're able to do that in a single cool down in about five hours. Um, so again, a very high volume of data is coming out of the, uh, the cryogenic wafer prober. And we do have a wafer prober that's being offered to the community um, if they want to try that out. Uh, the last solution that I'll touch on here is the, uh, the millikelvin cryostats. Um, what's shown here on the screen is an ADR cryostat, but this could equally apply to a dilution refrigerator. Um, and what we're doing is we're pairing our PQ500, our probe socket technology, uh, with the millikelvin test environment. So customers can take this device, uh, skip wire bonding, skip packaging the device, and you make direct contact to the device with probe tips. Uh, that gets plugged into a socket in the millikelvin environment. 
and then you can perform uh, the basic characterization measurements on a quantum processor. Uh, so this is being used uh, for qubit and resonator characterization, process control, as well as materials development. Um, and we're also offering these systems to vendors who are looking to qualify components in the signal chain. Things like you know, RF amplifiers, hemp circulators, isolators, other filters, and that sort of thing. So with that, I'll conclude and just say that uh, form factor is here. We're focused on customers and enabling the quantum market, uh, both with millikelvin deployment and our test and measurement solutions. So uh, we're excited to work with the, the community and please bring your use case for discussion here. Uh, my name is Vikas Anand. I'm the CEO uh, of Photon Spot Inc. Um, Next slide about what we do. We build scientific instruments uh, for research and development, mainly used in university labs uh, and uh, national labs, uh, a lot of the quantum startups. Um, our hardware that we build uh, is specialized uh, primarily for housing single photon detectors that need to be at sub Kelvin temperatures. Um, but our cryo tests are used for other applications uh, as well. Uh, all right, so this is uh, one of our main products. Uh, this is a compact tabletop cryostat. Uh, it goes down to uh, 0 0.8 Kelvin or about 800 millikelvin. Uh, it uh, can fit in a 19 inch rack as you can see on the image on the right. Um, it's not very power hungry. You could run this in your um, uh, in your garage, if you wanted to, uh, run it off 110 volts. Um, it can house a lot of detectors or, or other um, experiments. Um, and uh, in addition, it can fit in a suitcase uh, if you want to uh, take it places. Um, the compressor, however, does not. And I'll show you the solution we had for that. Uh, this is a larger version of the of the preceding cryostat. set. Um, this one can fit a lot more stuff in there. So we built this to fit up to 64 single photon detectors or uh, detector arrays uh, or other um, quantum optics applications. We built these with free space optical access as well. Um, so you can have sub Kelvin temperatures along with uh, free space access and um, and potentially some uh, low vibrations as well. Uh, another uh, uh, price that we've built, um, and this is uh, through funding through an SBIR through DARPA, uh, was a compact uh, rack mountable cryogenic system. So what you see in the box there is uh, a cryostat that can go down to 800 mil Kelvin. It can house a number of detectors. Uh, it has a compressor, a helium compressor as well, uh, vacuum pumps to pump it down. Um, it's basically everything is inside that box. Um, uh, and that height is about uh, six rack units. So that's about 10 uh, inches or so in height. Uh, so that's uh, that. Um, another product that, that we've just uh, uh, put out right now is a temperature stabilized um, cryogenic system. So this is mainly in use for um, just injection arrays and, and, and multiple standard um, type applications where you want to operate at temperatures around four Kelvin, but you don't want temperature oscillations. Um, normally you would have oscillations that would be hundred X, but we've shown uh, in this plot here where the oscillations are limited to around three millikelvin. Um, so there's that. Uh, so where are these cryostats used? Um, one of the applications uh, is for long-range optical communications. So we've delivered uh, cryostat, actually one of our first ones, um, uh, that went down to sub Kelvin temperatures was used by uh, JPL um, for uh, a NASA mission uh, where they uh, received photons from a satellite that was orbiting the moon that was uh, LLCD or lunar laser communications demonstration. Um, and that housed some of these single photon detectors. Uh, we've uh, recently um, delivered a few other cryostats uh, that are going to be used for the next uh, launch of the Artemis, assuming the first one goes well, uh, that's supposed, that was supposed to happen on Monday. Um, and this uh, will also do optical comm, but this time from the Orion spacecraft itself. 
Uh, and that in itself is revolutionary because that's broadband from space. And in both of these situations, you can really have a lot more um, data coming down. Um, the other, uh, you know, we have a lot of customers that use our cryostats and detectors for, um, for a lot of applications and they really um, uh, do use these and, and are able to, to you know, get excellent results and publish in, in some of the top journals. So this is just an example of, of a few of them in nature and science. Um, and uh, here's my contact info in case uh, people are interested in, in talking cryo. Uh, thank you. All right. Great. I'm glad to be here today to share our company's role in the Cryo for Quantum webinar. My name is Arifin Budiharjo, Business Development Manager with uh, Cryomac. Cryomac designs and manufactures cryo coolers since uh, founded in 1963. Today, we have more than 160 employees, and we are an employee owned company located in Syracuse, New York. In addition to the cryo coolers, we also design and manufacture helium management products, of course, powered by our cryo coolers and also cryostat powered by our cryo coolers. The industries we're in today will touch more specifically in quantum technology, and we're also in the life sciences, clean energy, telescopes, and other industries utilizing low temperature physics. So our focus is innovation. And this is uh, consistent from the beginning when uh, Bill Gifford, our founder, co-invented the Gifford McMahon and the post tube cryocoolers until now. So I've, I've used the term cryocoolers. Some of you may not be familiar with this term. So I, I wanted to make an analogy here. So these individuals are skillful in their areas with dexterity, artistic, and scientific capabilities. And uh, their performance are enabled by having a strong heart to start with. So likewise, in, in quantum uh, technology, dilution refrigerators are skillfully crafted using advanced technology to reach the millikelvin level of temperature. So I would like to say that their, perform their performances are enabled by having a strong cryocooler to start at four Kelvin. So that is one example of the cryocooler's role in the quantum technology ecosystem. There are other applications as well, but uh, I just wanted to focus on this in this uh, talk. So Cryomac designs and manufactures cryocoolers over the years, we consistently innovate to design larger and larger cooling power at 4 Kelvin. And we continue to scale our technology as uh, going to the future. Our latest products in 2021, we introduced PT425, the largest pulse tube with 2.7 watt cooling power at 4.2 K, 4.2 Kelvin. We also recognize that focusing at three Kelvin could be helpful to our dilution refrigerator customers. Thus in uh, 2022, we introduced PT310, specifically designed to have maximum cooling power at three Kelvin. Both pulse tubes are available with integrated motor and remote motor, which will reduce the vibration even further. So finally, what, what do we want you to know from this webinar? So at, at Cryomac, we want to collaborate with you. We want to enable you to focus on your quantum expertise and not to worry about how to consistently get to 4 Kelvin. So as a uh, Master Yoda has said, do or do not, there is no try. To get to the most cooling power at 4 Kelvin, do use cryomac cryocoolers. So let's collaborate. And with that, uh, thank you for your attention. Please contact us. So my name is Stuart Woods. I'm the Managing Director of Oxford Instruments Nanoscience. Give you a bit of background. 
Oxford Instruments uh, is a publicly traded company in the UK. Uh, we're part of Oxford Instruments Group. Uh, we were founded in 1959 by Sir Martin Wood uh, and, and actually went public in 1983 after we uh, developed and shipped the first MRI machine in 1980. Currently, we're about 360 million, sorry, 360 million pounds, about 420 million in US dollars. Uh, globally, we're about 1,700 people with about 24 locations globally. Now, from a product and market standpoint, our goal is to really focus on enabling scientific development, not only in quantum, but in a lot of material activities uh, ranging from life sciences to semiconductors to advanced materials. So the focus is really uh, expanding the understanding and, and has been uh, since 1959, enabling research at the most fundamental way. Within a lot of uh, quantum activities, uh, you're probably familiar with our activities around cameras, which are from our Andor brand, or our semiconductor processing equipment, which is from our plasma business unit. I'm actually in the nanoscience business unit, uh, and we're, uh, we're part of the, as I said, the Oxford Instruments group. Now, nanoscience uh, business unit has a long history of providing uh, cryogenic systems, uh, including into quantum, uh, dating back into uh, even before 2019, uh, into the quantum market. This gives you sort of a road map of our milestones as it relates to what we've been able to provide to the marketplace. Some key points that I wanted to highlight, particularly for quantum and for the US market, because as you probably have figured out, I am an American. I'm also the first American managing director of Oxford Instruments. And so with that, uh, obviously working with QEDC and Mark and the rest of the larger team about enabling quantum in the US is something that is quite close to my heart. So in the US, we have over 440 people present in the US, including sales and marketing, as well as two production facilities. Um, as uh, our friends from Lakeshore will, will test, uh, we, we actually have the coldest fridge in North America at the Lakeshore facility. And one of the key points that we're really focused on for the US market is the whole concept around supporting both industry, but also academic research. With that, the key for all this comes down to, to the technology and innovation roadmap. Uh, we have a clear and solid path uh, for uh, dilution refrigeration up to 1,000 qubits. Uh, we also are very much focused on vertical integration. So with that said, uh, we are the only dilution refrigerator manufacturer that has our own in-house wire and uh, uh, magnet manufacturing facility. So. Uh, we're fully integrated from a magnet standpoint. And, and the key for me and the most exciting thing is our focus and our investment in HTS wire technology, which uh, over the next, uh, you know, recent, uh, you know, say over the next two years, the goal is to really get to uh, nice and, and small compact to scientific magnets greater than 25 Tesla from that standpoint. As I said before, a lot of this comes down to key partnerships and engagements. Uh, we value our helium supply uh, quite uh, uh, fundamentally. It is something that we spend a lot of time working on. All of our helium is sourced through US sources and supply. And as I said, uh, strategic partnerships and engagements are fundamental. Uh, not only do QEDC, uh, we're a member of, we're a member of QSTAR, uh, but uh, we're also a founding member of UK Quantum, uh, and we're looking at also supporting and expanding into uh, Australia and supporting that market as AUKUS starts to develop and expand. Like I said before, on the magnet side, uh, we're quite a strong partnership uh, with the High Field Lab in Florida, as you see on the right. This just gives you an overview of our timeline of how we support and enable uh, quantum, uh, particularly in the US. With that said, from an Oxford Instruments nanoscience standpoint, we have three key locations uh, for uh, dilution refrigerators. Uh, we have our applications lab and sales office in California. We have a sales office in Georgia, and we also have our uh, headquarters for North America in Massachusetts. Contact details are here, nanoscience at oxfordinstruments.com. Uh, 
But one of the key points that I want to highlight is, is our focus on really establishing and growing uh, working in quantum. Uh, as you all know, as, as the other member of the members of the panelists will know, uh, hiring uh, folks to work in quantum is, is very competitive and difficult and, and time consuming. So we've launched a, a focus on videos uh, with a, a list of uh, interviewees, including Celia speaking about how she got into quantum. And that can be found at nanoscienceoxense.com, working in quantum. This gives everyone a sense of, and the goal here is to really encourage STEM uh, uh, excitement around working in quantum uh, and help us all get uh, people into the market and into the industry. The other point to highlight is, is our activity around sustainability. I believe, and I, I hand on heart do believe that quantum uh, does have a play in understanding the environment. And that really comes down to some of the focus on sustainability. So thank you for your time. My name is David Gunnarsson and I'm the CTO at Blue Force. I will talk about Blue Force role in the quantum ecosystem. I will jump in directly and explain who Blue Force are. So we are an engineering and manufacturing company based in Finland. We have been in operation for around 14 years. And during these 14 years, we have grown into a considerable sized company. We are now represented worldwide uh, with both sales and service functions. I can especially mention that we also have an outlocated uh, lab in Delft, uh, Holland, where we actually do offer test and measurement as a service for, for, our, uh, for customers. Uh, the business we are in is cryogenic measurement systems. So this is systems that allow users to measure devices at temperatures that are close to a, a, a few thousands of a degree above absolute zero. Uh, the technology we use for this is something called dilution refrigerators. And this is the core technology for Blue Force. And from the start, Blue Force have been focusing on dilution refrigerators. And you can see an example of this system here in the corner. Uh, Blue Force role in the quantum ecosystem, uh, the quantum technologies, some quantum technologies require these low temperatures to actually be able to harness the quantumness of these devices. And these, of course, in the long run is something we would like to use to do quantum computations. Blue Force have a strong focus on cryogenics for quantum technologies. And we have made it our mission to make sure that we have the right technologies going forward and support the players in this quantum ecosystem. The way we have done it so far is investing in a scalable production environment for cryogenic measurement systems. And going on, we are focused on establishing an industrial supply chain for cryogenics to really allow this community to grow with their technology if they need cryogenics. Uh, Blue Force have a few different uh, uh, product areas, four I have listed here, and starting with basic research, which is of course the foundation and it's very close to our heart. The first systems Blue Force are for delivering were uh, scientific equipment to, to the scientific community. We have built further on that and also developed cryogenic measurement infrastructure to aid the users to actually uh, improve their measurements and make it easier to measure the devices at these low temperatures. In a little bit sil similar regime as cryogenic measurement infrastructure, we have a product group that we call high throughput characterization. Uh, this is more focused on micro aiding microfabrication to make sure that devices that are fabricated to work at cryogenic temperatures actually can be characterized at a high rate with sort of a good process statistics. Uh, on the picture here, you see our cryogenic wafer prober that allow you to uh, probe uh, full range uh, wafers down to temperatures below two Kelvin. The large but not least area is large scale and industrial cryogenics. So here we are creating cryogenic platforms that are supporting the quantum players in the quantum ecosystem with more complex and more demanding experiments where you require more having bigger payloads to actually do the, do the technology that you have at hand. Uh, as an example of a product we have here or concept is our KIDA system. 
that is made to support the larger payload at the lowest temperatures. With that, I would like to conclude with some key messages. And of course, we offer ready solutions for cryogenic measurement systems, and we are committed to continue uh, developing in this field and help the players in the community. We cannot really do this alone. There is a lot of uh, parts in this, this uh, community, so we are welcoming collaboration to actually strengthen this cryogenic supply chain. So we together can actually make a very strong quantum ecosystem for the future. With that, I would like to thank you, and you can contact Blue Force through this contact information. Thank you. I'm Corbin Tilleman Dick, the co founder and CEO of Maybell Quantum, and I'm very excited to share um, what we've been working on at Maybell in terms of simplifying the quantum future. Um, for the past many um, years, you know, the industry has been defined by the players that we've been seeing today. Maybell's kind of the new kid on the block, and we had a chance to look and realize that quantum physics is really hard. And we've designed hardware with the intent of making it a little bit easier. We were founded in April of last year, exited stealth at APS March meeting this year, and we're based here in Denver, Colorado, taking orders now for delivery in the first half of next year. Um, the work done over the past many decades in dilution refrigerators has been foundational not only to quantum, but to science more broadly, leading to Nobel prizes and fundamental breakthroughs in science. What Maybell has done is taken a step back and redesigned cryogenics for the quantum age, taken every component necessary for a high power cryogenic system and packaged it into two tight 19 inch racks that can roll through a door, plug into a wall, turn on and get you down to 10 millikelvin. But, you know, I think it's easy looking at the system to to see what's new on the surface, to see the door, to see the footprint. Um, You've done a lot of things beyond that to make it so that it's not just a gimmick and a new form factor, it's a, a step forward for the industry overall. So not only is it compact and high performance, it also has unmatched capacity. You can get over 4,000 superconducting traces to the bottom of a Maybell fridge, um, pairing a you know, icebox dilution refrigerator with our FlexLine technology. We've taken big steps forward in terms of the fundamental performance of the system, you know, a uh, groundbreaking approach to vibration isolation, a new thermalization and attenuation layout that allows you to do more with the limited cooling power of the fridge and software that allows you to integrate and interact with it in better ways. And I'll get to this in more detail. We've optimized the system for years of intervention free operation, taking away both failure modes and interaction points, maintenance points that have defined the industry for a long time. All of that innovation in the ice box itself is also paired with our FlexLine technology, which is a replacement for standi standard semi-rigid coax cables that has a significantly lower physical footprint, significantly lower thermal load, and significantly lower vibrational load, while still offering the robustness of being constructed with 3D materials and classical manufacturing techniques. Um, we're incredibly excited about what we're building and, and sharing that with you today. Now, as the, the new player here, I do want to spend a little bit of time focusing on what we've done to maximize uptime and reliability, because it's very easy to say that you've done that. But when the rubber hits the road, there are fundamental changes that need to be made to a system to allow it to run for years without you having to work a worry about leak checking about replacing apex seals, about things that fail on uh, dill fridges too often. One of those is we've gotten rid of the scroll pump from the circulation line and replaced it with a micro roots blower that can offer decades of maintenance-free operation. We've replaced the liquid nitrogen doers with a set of cycling internal helium traps that can run indefinitely with no need to ever heat up the fridge in order to uh, clear out your traps. We've removed all acid flux and solder from the system. Um, all of the uh, internal connections are welded, vacuum brazed, or metal to metal. And then we've done little things like integrate a chamber lift and put a door in. And on one level, that doesn't seem like a reliability issue, except it is if people are snagging a wire with a ring or, um, or 
uh, denting a radiation shield as they go to lift up the vacuum can and, and put it on. And we, we realized that by taking care of that inside the system, uh, we can make sure that it goes together easily for one person, a simple operation that takes you know, less than an hour to strip down the fridge and put it together. Or if you're just going through the door to the sample volume, a couple of minutes and you have access to the sample volume. Finally, I think all of us have experienced a flooded lab at some point. Um, we can run this system either water chilled if you have a water chiller that you're happy with or central water or air cooled. Um, you pair that with the usability improvements that we've made to the system, acoustic isolation so that the pulse tube isn't so loud, um, the, the front door, the desk, the uh, front loading design so that you can connectorize everything from three Kelvin all the way to the sample chamber outside the fridge on the table at eye level, and then insert the entire thing at once. And all you have to do is fasten down a couple bolts. And it makes for a very different way and a, a significantly streamlined way of interacting with your system. So we're incredibly excited about what we've built. We are eager to partner with folks and, and find opportunities to work together. And I, I look forward to hearing from anybody interested in the Icebox and in Maybell more broadly. Okay, so let's get into the panel discussion. So what is the total user experience, including interface and maintenance of your cryo solutions? Um, why don't we start with the costs? Sure. Uh, so um, we're, I guess, uh, compared to some of the other uh, people who've spoken, we focus on small. Um, and uh, as such, uh especially during the pandemic um you know a, a lot of that experience is uh uh you know we want the users to be able to uh open up the cryo uh not be afraid of it uh be able to troubleshoot when there are problems in there um and do as much of that uh you know rather than having someone come out there um or to ship the entire system back um uh, so so that that's been a lot of the focus the maintenance that the things that generally fail uh in a cryogenic system are the things that move so they're the mechanical mm -hmm. coolers um uh, that have moving parts um uh and other than that it can be solder joints and, and such um so so that's on the, the hardware side uh, on the software side you know uh uh, you know, we write software in Python that, that people can interface to um, as well. So, um, so that's that's at least for our systems. Great, great. Thank you. Arafin. Yeah, so uh, the maintenance, from a maintenance perspective, the post to cryocoolers compressor has a an absorber is some sort of filter that needs to be replaced every 20,000 hours. And the post tube itself, as I indicated, because there is no moving parts, it will not require any maintenance until more than 40,000 hours and sometimes it's even, even more. So, and that, that's one of the advantages of, you know, why in addition to the less vibration compared to a Gifford McMahon cry cooler, and that's of the reason why dilution refrigerators uh, typically choose to use uh, pulse tube cryocoolers. But also, you know, how, how about the total user experience? Is your platform a, a an automated solution? Is it set it and forget it? How does that? How does the user, like if the dilution refrigerator manufacturers, use your pulse tube or you know Griffith Man? Yes, yeah, so, experience using it. Is it automatic? Can you expand on that? Yeah, so in, in this case, it's uh, becoming part of the dilution refrigerator itself. You know, we like to think that, or we want to uh, continue improving it in terms of the uh, how the interfaces. So uh, that's uh, in what I think will be a continuous improvement activities, how we make it easier to the, at the end of the day, the end users, right, to, to use the dilution refrigerator, including the cryocoolers. Yeah, right. Right, right. Okay. Um, so, Jack. 
Yeah, I think um, depending upon which tool you're talking about, um, one of the things that we're doing, especially from the, the test and measurement side, um, is really incorporating our fully automated software. So it's it's a very open right. platform where research can, or you know, whoever's doing the, the measurement, they can kind of bring in their own scripts. Um, we have uh, consultants here to kind of help work through the various measurement parameters that need to be set up on the instrument and make sure that, uh, for instance, on the wafer prober, they've got the right probing solution. Uh, so we're, we're really there to walk hand in hand with the customer, develop the solution tailored to their, sp their specific goals. Um, and then just from the, the infrastructure and cryostat standpoint, again, it's, it's the idea of trying to make it user friendly. So giving users the flexibility they need, but then also taking care of a lot of the, you know, the basic operational controls and try to bring an automated experience to that. Um, and I think that's the philosophy that, that we're bringing to, you know, both the ADR cryostat product line, as well as the, the DR uh, product line. Mm -hmm. And the DR product line is the recent add to your portfolio, right? Yeah, so that was the, the recent acquisition that brought um, the dry dilution refrigerators into our product line. And um, so we're certainly, um, you know, tending to the needs of the, the leading developers out there and trying to make sure that they have a hands-off system and that we really have the, uh, the support network out there to ensure maximum uptime. So that's, that's kind of where we're able to leverage the form factor network that's been established in the U.S. Uh, to really just ensure that users have the support they need and make sure that they're running uh, when they need to be. Yeah, great, great, thank you. David. Yes, so I think starting with Bluefers, when they did the first dilution uh, refrigerators, it was sort of a transformation when you could start using pulse tubes. So I think the first thing Bluefers did was to actually make sure that usability of the system was prior one. Yeah. Trigenics had existed for a long time, but changing the way you actually interact with the system was important and actually make the systems look nice because then you're actually proud of your system. But Bluefors has developed during these 14 years we have existed. And of course, ease of use is a keyword when it comes to add accessories, et cetera. So of course we are integrating quite a lot of measurement uh, solutions for the users. So for them, it's a lower step to start doing the the sort of work that they need to use our dilution refrigerators with. Uh, when it comes to a controlled software, we have a fully automatic software to sort of make it possible for the user to uh, control the system or not control it in that sense. So it's self-running. And how about the maintenance? So the systems were made to sort of be maintenance-free for three years from the start. But of oh, course, okay. The more critical your, your sort of operation is, of course, having predict predictable operation, you need to have preventive maintenance, et cetera. But uh, so it, it's good to sort of, there is components of the best manufacturers that are used. And they are then, as someone mentioned earlier, it's mechanical devices, they need to, to have attention. And we are in our new software, uh, developments looking more and more into how you actually can have a more predictive model for your for for these mechanics that are in these systems great great thank you so Stuart thank you Mark um, from our standpoint at nanoscience uh, I would say the focus really comes down to two areas one of which is is remote access uh, our our proteox OS which has its roots in the in the Triton system expanded on remote accessibility a lot of our customers were able to access their systems uh, during COVID remotely very easily, very quickly. And with the new Proteox platform and the OS behind that, we've been able to expand that. So a lot of the functions now uh, are, are completely accessible remotely uh, as long as the user has access to, to their local uh, infra internet. Um, from that standpoint, uh, from a flexibility standpoint, we revolutionized and started what we call the secondary insert so this allows users to build uh, their experiment or, or their, uh, their, their qubit system, if you want to call it that, offline, uh, and then insert it into the fridge in a single cartridge. It also allows them to uh, have a roadmap plan where they can actually build up multiple variations uh, in line with the roadmap as they develop, or even have it... Uh, configured and done off-site uh, at another location or even with a, 
uh, a supplier uh, of their choice. So from that standpoint, flexibility is key. Uh, with regards to maintenance, uh, it, it is pretty much as David said, we use Cryomac as well. Uh, so that's uh, quite key. Uh, everything looks at uh, maintenance free through three years. Uh, as Arafin said, you know, somewhere around 40,000 hours, you start to see uh, changes. It is a mechanical system, as David said. So around year four, you do start to see that level of uh, maintenance that's required. And, and it's the same as David said, you know, the key here is, is about regular and uh, routine maintenance. And we can either assist customers doing that, they can do it remotely. Uh, we have a variety of service offerings, uh, whether it's basic, essential, or premium, uh, that allows us to either uh, uh, support the customer uh, directly, uh, including having locations in, in like I said, uh, 24 countries, uh, 24 offices around the world, uh, and, and in fact, we do all of our support and maintenance and sales direct. So that's very key. So ah, they're always interfacing, always interfacing directly with a, uh, an OI employee. So that gives you a little bit of difference, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah great, great. Thank you. Uh, Corbett? Yeah, I would think about this in three categories. The first is the most frequent touch point, which is the software, right? And I think there have been big strides forward made by a lot of players in software over the last little while. The biggest things Maybell has done is our software is open source, coded in Python, and has accessible APIs that you can hook into. So you can either interact with our software, have one button cool down, and you know, manage that directly on the console. That's part of the two racks. Or you can sit on top of the software and never touch our software at all, but interface with it through APIs that are built into your control scheme. And I think that's important. The second is daily interaction with the fridge, right? And we've done a lot of things to make that better, putting a door on the fridge so that if all you're doing is swapping the sample, you open the door, you slide up the radiation shields, you have access to your sample volume in a few minutes, and you're able to you know, do that really quickly. Or the next most frequent type of change you're gonna be making to the fridge would be your wiring tree, right? And so for that, again, you use the integrated elevator, you take down the vacuum chambers, you take off just the front panels of the radiation shields, and then you're able to insert a fully loaded wire tree from 300 Kelvin all the way to the sample tree or sample space you know, as a quick swap in and out. And you can do that either across all 4,000 plus wires that you can fit in the fridge or with individual um, pillars. So do it in you know, three or six individual stacks that, that go in the fridge. Um, and then the third and final point is really this maintenance routine. And while I think it's uh, you know, a lot of systems with preventative maintenance and other stuff can apparently go for a couple of years, I think most of us who have used dill fridges for a lot of years have had the experience of you know, taking apart your scroll pump and cleaning out that powdery schmoo that's spread all through the system that is, I think, common to most other commercially available dilution refrigerators. By switching over to a roots blower, that doesn't happen. There's no, uh, there's no apex seal, there's no wear point on our uh, circulation line that causes that need. By going away from soft solder or acid flux on the dilution unit, we prevent kind of the formation of pinholes and leaks that can crop up not so much in year one or two of running a system, but in year five, six, seven of running a system. And so we've made sure that it's a welded or vacuum brazed component from you know, the top down. We've done things to make it so that the irregular maintenance, the things that happen when something goes wrong, you know, those are much less likely with a Maybell system because of fundamental changes we've made to the design of the system from you know, the pumps and the compressors, the moving components, all the way through the qubit volume. Great. So a uh, little tongue in cheek here, but are you, are you providing a free roadside assistance then? You betcha. <laughs> all right. Okay. Um, so let's start with... Uh, um, I guess, Stuart, uh, you know, how are you addressing the future RF density challenges as superconducting quantum computers? I mean, although other quantum computing technologies do still require cryo and we're focusing on superconducting right now, um, how are you addressing future RF density challenges as qubits go up, cables go up? Uh, you know, do we get a bigger hammer and build a bigger dilution refrigerator? Or, you know, how, how, how do you see helping the quantum, superconducting quantum computing companies deal with that? 
That's a good question. I mean, I think, Mark, you know, this sort of this is sort of parallels to how do we actually see the market evolving? Right. I, say, I would say we're probably pretty much in a brute force environment right now, probably till about 2027. OK. okay. Uh, and in that, uh, you know, David and I are providing very large giant fridges, right, purely for the ability to uh, explore and enable uh, applications and develop the application environment, right? So brute force is, is now carrying a lot of that. As we move into 2027, 2028, I think, uh, you know, that's where the elegance happens. I think that's where you have the cryo CMOS uh, start to, to move into the stages. And we start to see some elegance happen. And, and uh, I think David and I both hope that at that point it collapses back down to medium sized fridges, let's call it that, uh, and maybe even small fridges. And then as you start to get into 2030, uh, we start to see something that now becomes a little more elegant uh, in, in the evolution of technology. And, yeah. and really there's, there's no way that we can continue to, to sustain this level of, of RS, RF density scale up. It, it's just, it's, 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 it's nonsense. Right. And I, I think if you look at anything that's transpired in, in humanity and how we've sort of invented our ways out of uh, process, there's always an element of brute force before we get there. And, and we're certainly in that phase. And, uh, you know, you're probably looking at, you know, what, I, I don't know, David, what's your opinion? You know, let's say a dozen to, to, to maximum 20,000 cubic fridges around the world before it just sort of stops. And then we move on. And, and hopefully by that point, Microsoft and Intel and others have come up with elegance, which uh, breaks through some of this and uh, we collapsed it down to something that's a lot more uh, usable. How's that? Yeah, thanks, Stuart. Um, and, and, you know, I was actually going to call on David as well next. Uh, so you already did that. So, David, you want to add to what Stuart just said? No, thank you. No, I think Stuart's assessment of, of how, how the future is sounding quite, quite correct there. Of course, one thing that we don't really talk about yet is, of course, the use of it, like, what is the usable sort of quantum computer that is going to be there? There is, of course, uh, yeah, yeah, that's the big question. <laughs> so Even course, beyond this discussion. <laughs> so, 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 of course, uh, I think at the moment it is brute force. But of course, uh, one thing that is good to mention also that we have quite many different technologies that needs cryogenics, and they have slightly different requirements on how they control and, and interact with their, their uh, qubits. And, and that, of course, makes it very hard for the sort of community because you need to develop so many different types of solutions that have different uh, criteria. And uh, th that is also a challenge in itself. Of course, people still need a lot of wiring at this stage, but they also, it, it's hard to know what are the compromises that can be made. And that, that's something that the, would I was talking about collaboration earlier that that of course is that is something that is needed from the what what are the what are the benchmarks that are sort of makes makes this increase in density easier at least in this brute force area right right but right Corbin uh, oh go ahead David I didn't mean to cut you off keep going yeah, well then if we ever gonna get to small system I don't know the cryogenic physics is always difficult to, to make small especially if you need to have cooling power, because I think that need is not going to go away. So uh, cooling so the power, power is in the the of the right? So even if, even if we make them smaller, they're still going to give, they're still going to have heat dissipation to deal with, right? Uh, Corbin, I mean, yeah, oh, Corbin, go ahead. You, you guys have some new technology in, in how you're dealing with the RF side of it, at least, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think there, there are two things you can do when faced with trying to deal with the density challenges around quantum. The one is make a bigger fridge. The second is make smaller wires and components. And what Maybell's done is, yeah, our, our sample volume is certainly among the largest you can get, 100 plus liters if you go for what we call the big door configuration, um, which allows for a lot of wires, even if you're using traditional SMAs. But importantly, we've also flowed down that second track. And our flex lines today offer you know, a 70% reduction in thermal footprint, a 60% reduction in physical footprint. And they're much softer than competing components. But that reduction in footprint 
is only the beginning. You know, we've been able to start working with partners, you know, the uh, microwave electronics, the uh, XMAs, the, the folks building the attenuators, the circulators, the amplifiers, and nobody's asked them before for really small components. They believe that they can make them. And that means that our pitch density on our flex lines, which are, you know, niobium titanium ribbon cables, effectively, like you would use in a classical computer, except made with superconducting components that you need in a quantum computer, our pitch density has a roadmap of getting well below one millimeter per trace. At that point, you may not need these room size systems in order to get a quantum computer that is incredibly valuable and useful. You can do that in something that fits into standard networking and server infrastructure. So that's that's why we're pursuing those two tracks. Yes, big, powerful fridges, but also high density wiring that offers performance advantages and is paired with smaller components that you know make the future possible without building you know enormous you know ten million dollar systems. Yeah, great, great. Jack, uh, you want to add? Um, are you satisfied with those answers, or you want to add something to it? No, I think there's there's been a lot of good comments there. I think, um, you know, I think where where form factor is in a really interesting position here is that uh, for for many many years we've served the uh, the semiconductor industry and the five G industry, um, which is an industry that really demands you know high bandwidth interconnects, high bandwidth testing. Um, so it, and you know in five G and other cell phone and typical semiconductor devices, we're talking everything from, you know, single digit gigahertz all the way up to 40 or 80 gigahertz. Um, and form factors had to really develop the MEMS and probing technology to create the interconnects um, that can operate at those frequencies. So um, we're, we're now taking that room temperature technology and what's been done for that industry and really bringing it down and translating it into the, the cryogenic and quantum world. So um, we've got a long history of, of working on those frequencies and then also creating very high density interconnects or high density probing solutions. So I think right now we're, we're really interested in, in partnering with leading developers and really trying to enable that work because I think you know, getting the cables down uh, through the system, that's one challenge. But then of course you have to consider how do you actually connect that to the chip and what do those yep. interconnects look like? How do you go from that, that high density cable to the actual device under test? Um, and I think that's where form factor is uniquely positioned to really offer um, you know, leading solutions to the market here. Yeah, great, thanks, Jack. Uh, Arafin and Vikas, this it may not be an area that you're focused on, but if you want to comment on it, please do so. I was going to say we will continue supporting the scaling up by increasing the, the cooling power and also yeah. by having the 4K and 3K, uh, hopefully that, that helps. I think, you know, for all coming from semiconductor industry, it, it seems a uh, forum like this and uh, focusing creativity and innovation, it uh, can, can help us tra transitioning from, you know, so-called uh, the vacuum tube era to the semiconductor era. So. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Vikas, you want to comment? Vikas, oh, you're on mute. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I said a lot of good points have been made on this already, so I think. Um... Okay. All right. Well, there's there's others for you, and I'll I'll start with you next, right? If there if there when there is a fault in your cryo system, what is it typically? What is a typical recovery? And yeah. you, you've done some stuff for space, so I'm really curious so how you would answer this. Well, no, our stuff doesn't fly. Um, but oh. uh, yeah, the, I think um, when something fails, uh, you know, so uh, the first question that usually comes up from our users is, uh, I just want to do my experiment. I you know i just so yeah. usually they're looking for a workaround okay um as opposed to a fix that might take them down for some time so um uh we've uh you know put a lot of thought into being able to do that uh usually with redundant you know um wiring or, or whatnot it depends on what fails um with our cryostats you know the cry coolers they do eke out over some time. They they start to fail. They don't just fail, you know, from one day working to the next day, you know, um, 
not. There's sort of a gradual, you know, usually a gradual failure mode. Um, and so, uh, you know, make sure that they can still use them uh, for their experiments. Um, the goal is to outlast, at least for a university user, is to outlast the lifetime of a graduate student in a lab, uh, which should be hopefully no more than four or five years. But, you know, if you're doing a super PhD, maybe that's that's 10. But, um, you know, that, that that's at least the, um, the goal. Um, and then beyond that, um, you know, uh, how can we do this without uh, disrupting, um, uh, you know, without having to ship either people or equipment back and forth, especially if it's overseas. Um, it is impractical to ship a dilution fridge over. You can ship one, one of our systems over if it comes to it, but um, we'd prefer to send them a small FedEx box with a, 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 I don't know if it's a temperature sensor, whatever it is, you know, that they can then plug in themselves um, rather than uh, send someone over with a screwdriver and, and have to do something that, you know, a capable experimental physicist can do. Uh, yeah, yeah. Can do a lot more. Great, so great. Do, so. Air, Arafin, how, how would you, you know, how does this look like with, with uh, Cryomex products? Arafin, okay, let's skip and go to Corbin. Okay, Arafin, yeah. you go ahead. Oh, yeah. okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, Arafin. Oh. Yeah, I, I I was saying that when there's a fault want... in your cryo system, what is a typical recovery? What we want to do is how to be the least disruptive to to our customers, and while fault can certainly happen once, uh, typically once the system is is up and running, it will take. Uh, a couple of years until the, the performance is reduced, you know, because of the reliability. And of course, I, I'll take the opportunity to uh, promote uh, consistent uh, preventive maintenance to uh, to avoid that. So your system typically doesn't fail for a couple of years? It's not really a fail. It's more like a reduced performance uh, when, when uh, you know, for some of the adsorber need to be uh, Chains and 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 so on. So, so it's, it's good to have a it's it's good, a good preventive maintenance, correct? Okay, okay great. Okay, so um, Corbin. Yeah. So again, we we have less experience with this in the field because we're an early stage company. But I will say we've designed the system from day one to make it simple for people to do this maintenance themselves in the field or to have us support them. For example, the dilution unit itself. There's a flange that connects it to the still pumping line. And then everything below that you can take out as a single unit and swap another one in, right? And mm -hmm. that same mindset kind of flows throughout the system that how can we make it so that you can make the changes that need to be made, make upgrades, make you know maintenance things with as little disruption to the system as possible um, and with as little expertise as possible. We've uh, initially, a lot of those choices were made to make the manufacturing process easier so that we could keep up with our aggressive shipping timelines. We wanted to uh, make it so that we could have you know, a, a workforce that was more specialized working on the dilution unit rather than you know, a, a pod working on a full integrated system. But it also has proven really nice as we've been innovating to be able to swap out components with pretty high modularity. And that's something that then our customers benefit from um, as well. Great, great, great. Um, Stuart. I think uh, I think the key here is like we discussed, uh, or I, I guess uh, from the discussion was uh, preventive maintenance. Uh, that's one of the key elements to this. We sort of highlighted that earlier. Um, with regards to, let's say the worst happens, um, let's say you have situations where customers do not uh, do preventive maintenance. Uh, the key for us is to really get remote access and support the customer in doing the diagnosis to understand how to do that quickly. We have a product called Live Assist, which is basically a similar to a, uh, a screen and video sharing that allows customers, to, if they if they choose to have that offering as part of our service mm -hmm. offering, uh, that allows you to sort of interface with the machine and the person at the same time so that people can be walked through situations. 
Um, we're also looking at other options such as uh, you know, 5G uh, modems for connection to situations where uh, users might not be able to, to get outside of their firewall because the IT at a university might not allow that. So we've been expanding the remote access capabilities because the key is to actually quickly getting to the point of understanding the fault and then being able to act upon it quickly. Yeah, because it's a big issue, right? I mean, if, if, if you have a large uh, superconducting quantum computer uh, in a large you know, dilution refrigerator and that goes down, it can take days to get back up, right? Well, you know, it, it, it's, uh, you know, typically when you have, and, and David will probably comment as well, you know, when you have customers that have large fridges, they probably do their uh, maintenance on a pretty regular basis, right? Yeah, so we don't, we right. don't actually see it. You know, the ones that, uh, you know, that, that we have to really work with and, and partner with are, are those that uh, are at universities where they might have grad students. Oh, I see. Students, which I change, see. Yeah, yeah, right. Which so change less annually, consistent right? Consistent maintenance. But, yeah, right. Yeah, so, you know, I would say David's probably in the same situation as I am where we're almost sometimes in a constant training loop, right? Um, yeah. And that's, you know, I would say uh, not to be offensive, but university students today are not plumbers and electricians like I used to be, right? You know, right, right. you know, I, I'm Mark. I'm. I know you've redone part of your house as well. You know, we all sort of grow up trying to, you know, tinker, right? And, and that's a little different, I think, with uh, with students uh, coming out these days. They're not as attuned. It's a different skill set, right? Exactly. Right. That's right. 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 Um, you know, worked on hot rods, all that stuff growing exactly. up. Exactly. So, so, Same with me, so, so, right? <laughs> Ducati, the Ducati motorcycles in the garage. Exactly, exactly. David? No, I, I would second Stuart on that. Uh, of course, maintenance is, of course, the key here to avoid the faults. But uh, I think when the, the systems of today are actually not so bad as maybe Corbin makes them out to be, that's why <laughs> people in the universities use them above the sort of the borders of maintenance. So they fail at the very late stage. Uh, but I think if I look on Blue Force, our dilution unit is, is also replaceable in field if there is failures there. Oh, I see, okay, it great. It's made modular from the beginning. Uh, redundancy is also something that we offer as solutions. So, you, so if there's mechanical failure in the room temperature parts, you have a quite short downtime to do the I see, I see, I see, and, great. And of course, the, the, the uh, pulse tube itself, which is a quite critical part in our systems, as Arifin said, they have quite good reliability. And if there is a, a fault in them, it's usually very slow. So it's something that you can actually, you, you can keep on running and actually do a planned maintenance. Uh, as he said, you can watch its performance start to degrade, so you know something's yeah. happening, so you can plan for that event, right? Yeah. But I think that that is, it is, of course, the more the more stuff the user put in this system, of course, if, if there is a failure that it actually have to warm up, it is, of course, a long overhaul. But there is a lot customers can do to avoid that, and maintenance is one thing, and uh, and making sure that redundancies are there. And in the best way, they maybe should have two computers running parallel. So that's yeah. <laughs> right. Um, a lot of, lot of ground was covered here. Jack, do you have anything to add? Um, nothing major to add. I, I just think that, um, you know, I'll just say from the form factor perspective, a, a lot of it is a, is a mindset. You know, I think uh, it's a mindset of continuous improvement, paying attention to what users are asking for and, and the types of things that they're coming across and making sure that we have resources dedicated um, to changing those things. Um, the, other, the other thing that we really uh, leverage is, is the experience with the semiconductor industry. Um, we understand how critical uptime is. And when we're building a new product or bringing something to market, uh, I think that's ingrained in the mindset of how something's designed is that you know, 90, 95% uptime is, is almost a requirement. And uh, making sure that the instrument's compatible with that, and that you also have the service people uh, there to ensure that amount of uptime um, is critically important, especially as we start to see, see quantum uh, scale up and get into that industrial mindset, that industrial mode. Um, yeah, yeah, thanks. Okay, uh, you know, I think we're gonna skip that question. We don't really have time. Um, 
So I'm just, I'm just, I'm going to leave it. We're sort of wrapping up here. Uh, I'm going to leave you with this, you know, with the companies that presented today, where do you see each other potentially partnering? Any of you see any potential partnering, David? Well, of course, it, it's, we are all in the same field. So in that sense, we are doing very comparable uh, devices, but of course there is, there is a, there is overlaps, but there might also be uh, areas where there, there might be possibility for collaboration too. As I said earlier, I think we all have a task to actually build a cryogenic, uh, industrial cryogenic uh, supply chain, and that we have somehow do together uh, and engage with traditional suppliers to make them develop for cryogenics. And uh, I think that 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 is uh, something you get in volume when you start sort of uh, addressing it together. Yeah, uh, yeah. Stuart. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, as we continue to expand, I think one of the key things, probably the opposite of the partners is, is really understanding who's your, who's your partner, but also who's your supplier and who's your customer. I think mm -hmm. one of the key points from our standpoint, which is probably the, 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 the opposite of this question is, is making sure that we, as the market grow, uh, don't compete with our customers, but also don't compete with our suppliers, right? And I think that's one of the key points. That, yeah, I uh, wanted to cover the supply chain question beforehand, but I'm not uh, No, no, that's fine. So I think yeah. from our standpoint, you know, one of the key points is, is that balance of, of potentially partnering, but also knowing where to, to not uh, compete. And, and, and that's very fundamental, particularly as we work with our suppliers around the world, uh, you know, whether it's low noise factories or, or others, right, or, yeah. or Cryomac, uh, for example, um, or even Lakeshore, for that matter, on, on, their, right. on the call here. So we really focus on, on the aspect of understanding how everyone fits and, and exists in the ecosystem and then leveraging from there. Yeah, yeah, Jack. Yeah, I would say that we're, you know, I think we're really open to leveraging our technology and, and other platforms. Um, you know, we've kind of made this um, high density probe interface for cryogenic devices um, that we think is going to be really critical to, you know, enabling the quantum roadmap. And that solution is really hardware agnostic. So I think, you know, we, we are bringing a very open mindset to it. We're very open to collaboration and seeing, you know, what other systems can we leverage this, this type of technology in. So I think, um, again, it's just an open mindset and open communication and, and finding those um, development opportunities between the companies. Yeah, great. Corbin? I mean, all of us partner with Arifin a lot, I think. Um, <laughs> so, so I'll start there. But, but beyond that, I think that, you know, it is critical for us to look for opportunities to build things together. There will be quantum right. networks in the future where folks have, you know, something running in a Maybell fridge, something running in a Blue Force fridge, something running in an Oxford fridge and a form factor fridge. That's just the future that we all want to be part of and looking for opportunities to collaborate early. You know, maybe it's the you know, primary readout happens in a Dilfridge, but the quantum repeaters on a network are happening in Vicasa's um, you know, 800 millikelvin systems, right? There, there is a future that is kind of undefined ahead of us. And if the right opportunity for partnership comes up with anybody on this call, even beyond Cryomech, um, you know, Maybell would be extremely excited to to find ways to work together. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, and then, you know, there's also the, you know, we didn't have time to get into it today, but there's the hot buttons of, you know, helium-3 supply, holium, and supply chain. I think everybody on this call is interested in making sure that's all stable, right? So, uh, anyway, uh, did anybody else want to just add one little 30-second thing? I need to get into the schedule and wrap it up. Um, Arifin, anybody? I just want to say we naturally have many collaborations and collaboration discussions, you know, with each other. I think the more we understand what the other needs, the, the better we can progress. So uh, I, I think uh, comparing roadmap, you know, whether it's dilution refrigerator or SNSPD, uh, the, the more we work uh, together, the, the better the industry becomes. Yeah, and, and, you know, Celia and the QDC team uh, have been, you know, very active in making sure Cryo gets the support. So, um, Celia, you want to make any comments on that? I just want to thank all of the presenters. This has been a fantastic quantum marketplace. And QEDC remains committed to growing 
the availability of solutions um, for the system de developers. Um, with that in mind, we are, um, I'll just remind everyone that QEDC is funding some research in this area. And for those of you who are uh, members, you have the chance to track that and hear about it at QEDC events. So stay tuned for more on that uh, in the next few weeks. Thanks. Great, thanks, Celia. Okay, so then the uh, so we finished up cryo for quantum today, and then the next one's going to be uh, Tuesday, September twenty seventh. The potential for quantum networking. With that, thank you very much.